outrageous. This Judge, outrageous. Judge Storm, it's been uh, alleged that uh, 60 courts have refused to hear these cases, therefore there was no fraud in the election. Um, I guess another way of looking at this is that the court cases have been refused for procedural and technical um, reasons. When you see the 60 court cases rejected, do you think that's a conclusion by our court system that uh, there is no fraud, or do you think that the court cases were primarily rejected for procedural reasons? Right. Senator Paul, it is my understanding that the vast majority of these uh, cases were uh, rejected for uh, rightly stated procedural reasons. Uh, as opposed to a merits-based or substantive-based uh, evaluations. And of course, we saw that very recently, and I think most dramatically, by the Supreme Court's unanimous rejection uh, of the uh, bill of complaint uh, filed by the Texas Attorney General, uh, my home state uh, here. And the entirety of the decision was based upon the legal concept of standing. You just don't, Texas, have standing to object to what happened in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or whatever. And that is a reasonable ruling. Uh, there are those who would quarrel with it in that we are a United States of America and if something bad happens in one state that ends up having an effect on another state, we have such respect for our states as sovereign entities within uh, our uh, union that you know, the argument uh, is, I think, quite reasonable. Uh, and I think others think it's quite reasonable that at least the matter should have been heard under the original jurisdiction. I think yeah. that's a key key example. Yeah, and I think it's important, yeah. though, that we uh, look at this and understand what courts are saying and not saying. The courts have not said there wasn't fraud. The courts just simply didn't rule on or hear from the fraud. I do think there's an important issue here, though. The fraud is one aspect of this, and I think courts have historically been reticent to get involved in elections and to look at fraud. But moving forward, we've got to change the rules or reevaluate our state rules in order that this doesn't happen again. We can't just sit by and say, oh, it, you know, we're going to let it happen again. There is another important aspect to this, though, that is a legal aspect that I think does need to be heard by the courts. And I don't know if it can be heard beyond the election, but I think should. And this is the question of whether or not people who are non-legislators can change the election law. And this happened in many, many states. Probably two dozen states decided to accept ballots after the election. Two dozen states decided they could mail out applications or mail out ballots, all without the will of the legislature. Do you think there's any hope for any of this being heard, uh, Judge Starr, outside of the concept of changing the election? Is there any possibility any court's going to ever hear this and say that it was wrong that secretaries of state changed the law in the middle of this pandemic without the approval of the legislature? Or do you think there's no hope because it's mixed up in electoral politics? Judge Starr. I think there is a possibility because this issue may return in light of the use, this unprecedented use of mail-in ballots and the concern that is a bipartisan concern, again, the Carter-Baker Commission, uh, that we need to look at these issues. And so I think there is a doctrine, uh, Senator Paul, uh, 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 to essentially say this issue may recur again so it should not be washed out as being moot because there's a very important principle here as i made in my opening statement and in my written statement the constitution is very clear that it is the prerogative of state legislatures to determine what these rules and uh, laws uh, are and that was i must say flagrantly violated uh, in pennsylvania and perhaps elsewhere as as well yeah, see, I think the legal question there is a very easy one to decide. I think even as a physician, I can figure out that the Secretary of State cannot create law. I do think, though, that many of us who wanted this to be he heard by the Supreme Court and are disappointed actually also might be disappointed by the precedent of Bush versus Gore in the sense that I think Bush versus Gore's precedent is shutting down elections that have been certified. Uh, they weren't going to continue to count the hanging chads. The Secretary of State had certified it. So I actually think that the Bush versus Gore precedent actually argues against the Supreme Court overturning certified elections. Do you have an opinion on that? 
I don't have an opinion on that specifically. I think that Bush v. Gore stands for this basic proposition. You cannot have changes in election laws after the fact. You must, in fact, be faithful to what the state legislature has done. That's also what Justice Alito said in his opinion, uh, I think essentially condemning, but certainly identifying as a huge issue what had happened in Pennsylvania. So I think all in all, Bush v. Gore is just a reiteration of our constitutional structure. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, as we go on with this, I think it's important that we not stop here. A lot of the laws that have to be confirmed and I think reaffirmed are state laws, so it's not in our purview, but the state laws are set and then we have federal elections. So what we've heard about what happened in Wisconsin, what happened in Nevada, I think is absolutely true and we have to prevent it from happening again. I think state legislators legislatures will need to reaffirm that election law can only be chained by a state legislature. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. While we will not dictate it to the states, I think we should have hearings going into the next year, hearing from state legislatures and what they're going to do to make sure election law is upheld, not changed by people who are not legislators. And uh, we do have an interest in that. I don't want it to be federalized. Many on the other side of the aisle would just soon federalize it and mail everybody a ballot and we'll have this universal corruption throughout the land. But what I think we need to do is keep it at the state level. But we can't just say it didn't happen. We can't just say, oh, 4,000 people voted in Nevada that were non-citizens and we're just going to ignore it. We're going to sweep it under the rug and say, oh, the courts have decided the facts. The courts have not decided the facts. The courts never looked at the facts. The courts don't like elections and so they stayed out of it by finding an excuse, standing or otherwise, to stay out of it. But the fraud happened, the election in many ways was stolen, and the only way it'll be fixed is by, in the future, reinforcing the laws. And the only last comment I would say on what Mr. Krebs, and he can speak for himself, but I think his job was keeping the foreigners out of the election. It was the most secure election based on security of the Internet and technology. But he never has voiced an opinion, he's welcome to today, on whether or not dead people voted. I don't think he examined that. Did he examine non-citizens voting? So to say it was the safest election, sure, I agree with your statement if you're referring to foreign intervention. But if you're saying it's the safest election based on no dead people voted, no non-citizens voted, no people broke the absentee rules, I think that's false. And I think that's what's upset a lot of people on our side is that they're taking your statement to mean Oh, well, there was no problem in the elections. I don't think you examined any of the problems that we've heard here. So really, you're just referring to something differently is what I, the way I look at it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Carper. Uh, 